Not far from here, at the old Darlinghurst Jail, I went looking for a ghost. It was the ghost of Jimmy Governor. This was the place where he took his last breath. The old jail is now the site of the National Art School. The gallows are gone, but the place is deeply haunted. It's not at all hard to imagine what it once was. I walked down old corridors past what were once cold prison cells. I turned a corner and stopped suddenly. I looked up and my tour guide said, that's where it happened. Exactly there, she said, where I was standing was where Jimmy was hanged. Above me was where the trap door would have been and where the hangman would have placed the noose around Jimmy's neck. Jimmy Governor was executed at 9 a.m. on January 18, 1901. He was a murderer. He killed children. He killed women. He took an ax to a family and then went on a rampage of murder, rape and theft. Nine people he slaughtered. He became the most hunted man in the country. Jimmy Governor lived and died at the crossroads of our history. He marked a moment between the old and the new, between what was and what was yet to be, a time between time. And that's what draws us to this story, not just the crime, but what the crime represents. Jimmy Governor was an Aboriginal man who at the turn of the 20th century challenged the very idea of this country. He was married to a white woman he had white ancestry himself. He demanded a place in a white world. In the end, taunted, cheated, humiliated, his white wife rejected and insulted, he struck out violently. Jimmy was executed just two weeks after Federation. And here I was, searching for him still, looking back into the past to try to make sense of who I am. More than a hundred years after Jimmy died, he still cast a shadow over this nation. Jimmy Governor haunts me and he haunts Australia. We are now at a hinge point of history. To many, our world now looks like Cold War 2.0. China and the United States are locked in an escalating great power rivalry. Shots have already been fired. A trade war between the two biggest economies in the world damaged both countries and weakened global economic growth. China and the US have brushed up against each other in the disputed islands of the South China Sea. It is just one of multiple flashpoints. The Taiwan Strait, the Diaoyu Senkaku Islands claimed by both China and Japan, or the India-China border. All of them could trigger a rapid escalation to a much broader conflict. Just this year, there were casualties when Chinese and Indian troops exchanged fire along their disputed regions. Then there's the nuclear armed existential standoff between Pakistan and India, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. The Middle East we know remains a powder keg from Iraq to Syria to Yemen and Libya. In the Sahel region of Africa, the Democratic Republic of Congo or Ethiopia, terrorism and conflict rage. Relations are toxic between the US and Russia. Vladimir Putin has reasserted Russian power throughout the world, but particularly in the Middle East. He has grown closer to China and Xi Jinping. The post-American world imagined by writer and journalist Fareed Zakaria more than a decade ago is looking more real the great fear is a war between the two biggest powers on the globe, the United States and China. And the battle plans are already being drawn up. Historians look at this and see, like Eugene O'Neill, the past happening over and over again. They look at the world and they see the same fault lines as 1914. Back then, they said that war would never happen. Germany and Britain were each other's biggest trading partners and the Kaiser and the King were cousins. How wrong they were. The Australian historian Sir Christopher Clarke wrote a magnificent book about how the world drifted to war. He called it sleepwalkers. In 1914, he said, 
The world was enjoying a great peace. Economies were booming. Trade connected the world just like today. John Adams, one of the founding fathers of the United States and its second president once said, remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, murders itself. There never was a democracy that did not commit suicide, he said. So is this what we are seeing in our time, an inevitable death of democracy? When I set out on my journalistic adventure in the 1980s, democracy's future looked assured. The second half of the 20th century was boom time for democracy. Germany emerged from the trauma of Nazism. South Africa threw off the yoke of apartheid. Decolonization across Africa and Asia created new free democratic nations. And in other parts of the world, Latin America and Europe, autocratic regimes were swept aside. Between 1970 and 2010, the number of democracies in the world increased from 35 to 120. According to Freedom House, which measures the health of democracy, 63% of the world then lived in democracies. But something has happened. Freedom House in 2015 released its report, Discarding Democracy, the Return of the Iron Fist, which found an erosion in civil liberties and rule of law. It said that democracy was under greater threat than at any point in the last 25 years. So what has happened? History has happened. This is what the Indian writer Pankaj Mishra has called the age of anger. And this has been my world. In 30 years of reporting, I have followed that blood dimmed tide of hate. I've reported on the trail of blood where the ceremony of innocence is drowned. I have stood in bombed out marketplaces awash in boiling blood with twisted metal and the stench of burning flesh. I've seen mothers picking out what is left of their children from the shell marked holes in the walls. They place the charred bits of hair and skin into plastic bags because that is all they have left to bury. I've seen how quickly we can turn to violence. I've seen too often the evil we can do. I've seen how easily we can acquiesce to tyranny. As Camus said, in the age of ideologies, we must make up our minds about murder. If murder has rational foundations, then our period and we ourselves have significance. But we have made up our minds about murder and we have decided that often we are okay with it. One wrote, a nation is a soul, a spiritual principle. It was born of a marriage of the past and the present. One, the possession of a rich trove of memories. The other, actual consent. The desire to live together. The will to continue to value the undivided, shared heritage. Critical to Renan was the question of history. History could bind a nation or it could tear it apart. The study of history, he wrote, often poses a threat to nationality. Renan posed a challenge that resonates with us still today. Forgetting, he said, I would even say historical error, is an essential factor in the creation of a nation. Renan's words sound so incongruous today when we place so much weight on truth-telling. It has become a modern shibboleth that truth can set us free, that there is healing in truth. Perhaps so. As someone who was born into the great Australian silence, whose history, Aboriginal history, was written out of our national story, I know too well history's burden. I cannot easily wish it away, and forgetting for me has not been an option. And yet I know as well, from my time in the world, the dangers of too much history. I know that truth can also be a weapon. Truth does not always heal. It can torture us and it can turn us against each other. We approach truth with trepidation. And I wonder whose truth, what is truth? Do we not choose the facts sometimes to fit like items in a shop front window? When truth becomes identity, are there no longer facts, just interpretations? As we reckon with our past, we must also know that the past will reckon with us. So let me return again to that spot near where Jimmy Governor was executed. 
What was I looking for? What did I want from this man, dead now for more than a century? Why should I look to him and his awful crimes for some sort of validation? There have been times in my life when Jimmy Governor has been a symbol, when he has stood in for every face in my family, every humiliation suffered, every injustice visited upon us. In his murderous spree, I foolishly saw some form of vengeance. What I see now is a tragedy. His victims deserve to rest peacefully in our country, and I should put Jimmy's ghost to rest. I don't know that history reaches its end. We like to believe that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I've seen enough of the world, worst of the world to know that that is not always true. Sometimes if it bends at all, it more often bends to power. And power draws on history. History is a tale of unending suffering and humiliation, and that wound is never healed. Instead, it can become our reason for being. Save me from that. In the words of James Joyce, history is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. Thank you.